Do you like this? Do you like this? <laughs> well, no more. <laughs> <laughs> Located in the North Pacific Ocean, 7,195 miles away from the U.S., lies an organized, unincorporated territory known as Guam. It is the largest island of the Mariana Islands, with a rough population of 162,000. Now, I know what all of you are thinking. How come we have complete control over an island 7,195 miles away from the U.S.? America rules? Heck yeah. Hold your horses, we'll get to that. But first, we need about 500 years of exposition. It all started in 2000 BC, when people came to Guam from Southern Asia. They became known as the Chamorro people, with early traces of clans forming around 800 AD, making it official. They lived in latte houses and would grow rice and make pottery as part of their culture. In 1561, Magellan and his Spanish crew, what up, were sailing for the Roman Emperor and discovered Guam. The Chamorros didn't have a concept of ownership like we did. They believed that you take what you need, but in eyewitness accounts of the Chamorros boarding the ship, they took anything that wasn't nailed down. The Spanish left and named Guam the Island of Thieves, discouraging anyone to come back. Fast forward to 1565, when Miguel Lopez de Legazpi finally claimed the island for the Spanish. They wanted Guam so they could trade with the native people and spread Christianity. So how did we get Guam then? On January 1898, the USS Maine U.S. naval ship exploded and sank, killing 266 men. The U.S. blamed Spain with no proof because they supported the idea of Cuban independence. The U.S. set aside $50 million to fight against the Spanish, and so the war began. They fought in several Spanish territories. On June 21, 1898, the United States gained Guam and several other Spanish territories after winning the Spanish-American War. Spain signed the Treaty of Paris on December 10, 1898. They used Guam as a part of the Trans-Pacific Line of Communications. The Trans-Pacific Line of Communications is a $500 million telecommunications line that carries signals to China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and the United States using a cable that lies on the sea floor. When the U.S. actually arrived to claim Guam, the people living there didn't even know they were at war. The U.S. told them they had 30 minutes to surrender, and gave a letter to the governor. Reports say it took them almost 29 minutes to finish reading the letter, and they just surrendered. All of the people in Guam became American citizens. Hooray! In modern-day Guam, most of the island is used as a military base. 29% of Guam, to be exact, and has never been more on edge since little Kimmy J has been making some serious threats. The underwater telecommunication lines are still in operation. It's also now a part of the U.S. Postal Service. When sending mail to the U.S. from Guam, it doesn't cost extra. Also, one of the biggest markets in Guam is tourism. People can visit Guam with ease, knowing that they're on U.S. soil. There's also a wide array of malls to shop at. But there's also some problems in Guam today, one that has been affecting them since it was claimed by the U.S. Everyone living in Guam is a legal U.S. citizen, and the same laws passed by Congress in the United States they have to follow. The only thing is that they can't vote for laws that impact their lives, kind of like how England ruled us from afar. The whole reason why the U.S. got involved with the Spanish-American War was a really underthought decision with little to no evidence that the Spanish actually attacked the USS Maine. And the fact that we imperialized Spanish territories after it all, going against our belief in independence and George Washington's warnings, just baffles me. Well, after finishing on that high note, I think my job here is done. Thank you all so much for listening to my presentation, and I look forward to seeing yours. Unless I go last and this message is meaningless.